the RLC. Okay, we got it going. One of um, the recording going now. Uh, one of the uh, purposes of um, the textbook affordability working group is to um, uh, support the um, faculty that have interest and want to uh, adopt uh, open education resources for their courses in support of student success. Um, you'll see here um, the list of members of the textbook affordability working group for the Washington Research Library Consortium. Also, we refer to it as the WRLC. Um, each university has a uh, committee member that works specifically with um, ensuring that faculty have support for o OER. Um, if you happen not to see um, someone listed for your institution, please feel free to uh, reach out to uh, one of the two WRLC staff members listed. Um, they can be contacted at the email addresses listed there. Um, there is also one general uh, email address open at WRLC.org, and they will assist you in your endeavors to get started with um, OER. So our agenda for today, uh, we are going to talk about, well, given brief overview of open textbooks. Um, I'll do that for you. I'll also give an overview of the textbook review program. And then I'll hand off to my colleague, Kevin. Um, he'll talk about adopting, uh, re adapting and remixing OER. And then we'll conclude with uh, question and answers. Um, just to give you a brief uh, introduction to who Kevin is. Kevin is also a WRLC textbook affordability uh, group member. He is the uh, coordinator for digital scholarship at the Catholic Universities of America. And he'll give you more about his background as we get started. So for an overview of open textbooks, um, I'll start off by giving them um, a compare and contrast uh, to the commercial textbooks that we're all familiar with. Uh, one of the similarities is that um, open textbooks are available in uh, print and online formatting. Uh, print is available for those who are interested, but for a small fee, nothing um, like what you would expect for a commercial textbook, but printing options are available. They're written by experts in the subject area. Many of them are peer reviewed as well. Some of the main um, differences between uh, open textbooks and commercial textbooks are open textbooks are designed to save students money. Uh, specifically, they we want they want to uh, they're available to ensure that equal access um, is available to the course materials on the first day of courses, classes, and they're shared openly under the uh, common Creative Commons license, which makes them uh, allows uh, for them to be shared by students and faculty, and as well as adopt and remix for faculty needs. Uh, an additional advantage of um, open textbooks are that they impact student success. One of, one of the ways in which they do so is they allow for equity and accessibility beginning um, at the first of classes. Um, one of the ways they do so is they remove the cost barriers that are posed by commercial textbooks. Um, they allow for immediate access to the textbook um, anywhere the student has an uh, internet connection regard uh you know without the access codes and things of that nature that commercial textbooks um might require um an additional advantage of open textbooks is that they allow for engaging um, classes and one of the ways they do that is they allow for uh flexibility in faculty teaching practices so faculty are allowed to uh download, share, remix, um, take things from different sources uh, to make uh, the open textbooks fit, fit their teaching needs and practices. So how would one get started if, if they were interested in um, selecting an open textbook? Um, one of the ways you do so is you've taken the first step today by attending this workshop. 
Another thing that you can do is to view the open textbook library. I'm going to give a brief overview of that in a few minutes, but an additional step is to refer to or make contact with the open education um, resource librarian at your campus, uh, specifically those that were highlighted in the first, uh, first few slides that I shared. They are great uh, resources to helping you find the appropriate uh, textbook that you might want to adopt or revise for your courses. So, um, uh, Kevin, if you will um, share um, in the chat the uh, open textbook library link. Um, that will be for you all to uh, take advantage of afterwards um, and take a look at on your own. But I'm going to specifically take a look at one of the open textbooks uh, that are a part that is a part of the open textbook library. Um, the title is Exploring uh, Public Speaking. So um, I am now sharing uh, with you the open textbook library and it opened um, from the link direct, uh, directly to the um, book, uh, the catalog record for uh, exploring public speaking. So uh, from there, you can see a cover of the textbook. Um, it tells you what edition of the textbook it's in, at, uh, it's available in currently, followed by the uh, rating. Um, you also see there the name of the contributing authors, the year that it was copywritten, followed by the uh, last time it was updated, along with the publisher's name. Over to the right, you'll see uh, the table of contents and uh, the content, uh, the uh, title for each chapter listed. Over Back over to the left, you'll see the formats that the uh, book is available in. It's available in PDF format for easy sharing and downloading, um, ebook for easy reading, and uh, as well as Microsoft Word, which makes it easy for uh, editing and adapting and changing anything um, to make the course available uh, in the way you would like it for your um, the, the book available for the way you would like it for your course. Uh, following that, you'll see where um, the uh, Creative Commons license that it's uh, available under. If you click the link, you'll see uh, more information about the various types of Creative Commons licensing available, but that one is pretty uh, common there. I mean, it right, sp tells you specifically what um, license this one is shared um, under, available under. Um, I'm going to move over to the right this time and talk about uh, the show you where you can see uh, ancillary materials available. So if you click the, I won't do it here, but if you click the link, you can see what other course materials uh, the publishers have made available uh, for this book. Um, I took a look earlier and I saw where they have all of the lecture slides available, as well as the um, uh, format where the editions, the previous editions available, if you take like to take a look at those and also contact information for uh, the contributing authors of all of the different chapters. Then below that, you'll see where you'll see more uh, of a um, description of the book, more in-depth description of the book, followed by um, a biography of the uh, author. And then there's also the option to make recommendations or suggestions for editing um, the book record that we see here. So I'll go back up and I want to make note of the reviews that are listed below. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the uh, textbook review program that the WRLC is currently sponsoring. Um, you all are actually available to participate in this program by uh, participating in today's workshop. And what it entails is an opportunity to review one of the open textbooks available in the open textbook library. Um, you'll get a email from the Open Education Network following this workshop with instructions on how you can submit a review and be eligible for the $200 stipend that the WRLC is making available for book reviewers. So that is a quick overview of open textbooks and the open textbook library. Um, I'm going to stop here and hand it off to Kevin and he's going to talk about adopting and remixing OER.
All right, thank you very much, Misty. Um, so yeah, we're gonna look at adapting and remixing OER today. Um, so what we wanna do is say, you wanna, you're asking yourself, how can I possibly apply this to my course? So we'll ask some questions of you and uh, offer some basic tips and give you an outline of what to expect um, if you were to uh, work on an OER project. So uh, here's a good uh, definition of adapting and remixing, just to can compare with, uh, you know, adopting. So this, you know, adaption, uh, adaptation is commonly used to describe the process of making changes to an existing work. And that can mean a lot. So it could be revising, modifying, altering, uh, customizing, remixing, all this. So talking about uh, adapting and remixing, I'm sort of using it uh, interchangeably. So, so why would you want to adapt and remix? So there are a number of reasons that you want to do that. Um, you know, OER materials uh, are available to you and your subject. They may be too broad, uh, they may be dated, or there may be certain information that you don't want to teach for whatever reason. So adapting means you can edit out all the material you don't need and build in the information you want to include. Uh, in many respects, most of the work has been done for you. Uh, for example, uh, you can take a chapter of an open access book and, from one website and combine it with uh, scholarly articles and then add videos from another website, you know, assuming these licenses are open. So you can combine, mix and match whatever way you want. So adapting material uh, allows you to individualize uh, your course for your students and adapt, adding content uh, from different sources, you know, images, audio, text, uh, the selected by you makes the course unique. So um, some uh, questions uh, that you want to ask yourself um, embarking on this. So uh, first one is, uh, do I want to do this? Um, oops, let me go back here. Got ahead of myself. All right. So do you want to do this? Do you really, really, really want to do this? I mean, you're looking at uh, time commitment. You're probably looking at outreach to you know librarians or uh, instructional designers uh, or you know OER specialists. Uh, uh, you do have to think about that, possibly having students work on your book as well. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you need to consider. So you need to you know, reflect on that very basic question. Maybe you don't want to do this. It's always possible. So how will, next question is, how will using OER improve your course? So uh, when integrating OER uh, into your course, uh, you have the opportunity to critically uh, evaluate your methods and alter them to better meet your needs. So what do you want your students to learn? Uh, how will you communicate to students uh, that the concepts you present are valuable? How will you assess your students' understanding of core concepts? That's all, that's all part of working, um, creating an OER. Uh, so who is your audience? You know, who's your target audience? Who, so do you have a primary audience? You know, is it majors uh, students or is it non-majors? Uh, does your audience belong to a specific geographical location or ethnicity? Uh, are there cultural differences that you need to consider before creating uh, uh, your OER. So your OER, you know, once it's widely available, uh, it could be used by educators around the world. So you can create it um, with your local audience in mind. And those instructors around the world, they can uh, take what they want from your work and adapt it to suit their own needs. Uh, the next question you have to ask, most one of the most obvious ones is, uh, does this OER already exist? Uh, it's generally a good idea to look around at what content is available for your course, you know, before you create something new. Uh, there are two reasons for this. Uh, the OER that you want to create or use may already exist in the format you want. So you have to consider the format. Secondly, um, your own teaching materials uh, can, can be adopt, uh, adapted for use as OER. So for example, your lecture notes uh, can be uh, invaluable teaching aids for courses with no excellent textbooks available. 
you also have to ask yourself, you know, what changes would you need to make in order to share your own content as an OER? Um, what types and formats of OER are you looking for? And, you know, where should you begin your search? So I'll show you how you can begin your search in a bit. So, so how will you disseminate your OER? Uh, you know, whether you're using an OER as is or creating something from scratch, uh, one of the first considerations uh, you should take into account is how you will share the resources. So, you know, will you host your OER in an institutional repository? Are you going to use a third party platform? You know, uh, how will you make it evident that uh, when you or other creators post updates to the content? One of the advantages of OER is that you can go in quickly and update content as necessary. Uh, during your class, you know, how will students go about accessing the OER? Uh, these are good questions to ask. Um, what expertise is required to adapt OER? Um, creating an OER can be a considerable amount of work. And whether you're remixing or starting from scratch, it's important to consider all aspects for your project. You've got to include, you got to consider instructional design, you got to consider the technology, you got to consider the graphics before you jump in. And you have to ask yourself, you know, how, how much knowledge do I have in these three main areas? So what aspects of the project are you most and least comfortable with? Um, what support is available um, at your university uh, to help you structure, develop, and disseminate your project? Well, you've got the WRLC for a starter, so you're not going in totally blind. Um, is there support available to make your OER accessible in multiple formats? So good to consider. So integrating an existing OER into your curriculum doesn't need to be a, a, you know, a one-person job. Uh, instructional designers and librarians can help provide that guidance to help you incorporate open resources into your course. So uh, can your OER be reused or repurposed? Well, you know, one of the primary benefits of OER is that they are reusable. So when you're adapting, adopting an existing OER, you'll want to choose one that, is, it, that isn't so specific that it can't be adapted to your needs. So similarly, um, if you create your own OER, uh, making it easy to adapt will broaden its use among other instructors. So things to consider too is in what formats could you make your OER available? Uh, what formats are you used to working with uh, with regards to your own work? You know, and last, is your chosen OER does, uh, designated in such a way that you can pick and choose what content to use. So these are lots of questions, not meant to be exhaustive, but meant to get you really thinking about what you want to do. I pulled these questions from uh, the book OER Starter Kit uh, by Abby Elder. Um, there are a lot of OER books on how to write OER books, and we've got a slide at the end here. We have a slide at the end that, uh, that shows you a whole bunch of books that you can use and consult and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of great material out there. Uh, so part of the uh, OER starter kit was this wonderful workflow. Hey, I'm a librarian. I like workflow. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to show you this particular thing here, not to intimidate you or anything like that, but just give you a sense of uh, what you uh, what you have to consider and what stage of the process. So, you know, at the beginning, you're, you're, begin you're looking at research, right? You're looking at what's your subject area. Um, have you looked at OER that's out there? You know, have you have you been trained in OER and copyright? You know, this sort of thing. Uh, are you confident using that? And so the answer is no in any of them. They probably want to consult your local librarian and to help you uh, move forward in that regard. Um, so once you get over that main hurdle, um, you have the whole idea of pre-production. So, you know, what is it that you want to do with your OER project um, and go through and, you know, looking at assessment, volunteers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, at that point, you probably want to consult with an OER specialist. So we do have uh, some people who have experience with that in the WRLC. So um, that's what you can do. Uh, you're also looking at designing the, your project. Um, you're looking at developing your project, um, lots of stuff to consider, you know, checking IP, checking accessibility. Um, you want to put your project out there sort of as a draft and get some peer review feedback on it before you, before uh, you finalize it. You know, and your last part here is publication, you know, when you publish it, 
and disseminate where is it where is it going to go and land and, and be useful to most people so uh, i've got a number of topics here i just grouped some ideas together here so doing research that was the first part uh, of the workflow so you know what is available out there you have to consider copyright and licensing that sort of thing so Finding sources. Um, there's a whole bunch of individual sites out there. I just list two here, the Open Education Network, uh, OpenStax, just a couple examples. Um, if you really wanna go big time, you can do a meta search and use a Mason's OER meta finder. I've got a screenshot of the meta finder here. Um, go ask mom, right? So this is really great because uh, they pull from all these different individual sites, but they also pull from uh, Internet Archive and Hathi Trust and that. So you get a real broad section of material on your particular topic. So you want to discover what's out there uh, for you. So when you're dealing with copyright, uh, you know, open access, copyright and licensing, they all they all go together, right? So you want to talk about open, then you got to deal with the five R's, you know, retaining, reusing, revising, remixing, redistrib redistributing. Um, you know, the more that you have, uh, uh, you can do this, the more open it's going to be. So you have these various rights that you can, uh, that you can um, evaluate when you're uh, looking for an, a resource. I, will, I won't read the screen, I'll let you take a quick peek at that. All right, so you, you move into copyright and licensing uh, from that. So, you know, copyright is locked down uh, in the sense that creator owns the content, you know, once it's created, yet copyrighted material can be made open uh, if a particular license is used. So this is how copyright and OER uh, work together. So all, all OER are made available through some type of open license and the set of permissions from the right holder, the rights holder of a work for excuse me, any and all users. So the most open li license uh, other than being in the public domain uh, is the CCB, uh, CC BY I should say, which is the top one listed there. Um, you can go to the uh, Creative Commons website and take a look at all the different definitions. So, so this open one, the CC BY, it can let you distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon someone else's work, even commercially. Uh, as long as the original author is credited for the creation. So this is the most accommodating of licenses offered. So if you're not sure what license to use for your particular OER, uh, you can go to the creativecommons.org and choose. And they actually have uh, a number of questions and that, they, they, that uh, you can ask yourself and then move on from there so you can make an informed decision. And this particular um, diagram here shows you how, uh, you know, the, re the five R's pertain to the various licensing models here. So if you're working on, you know, if you have two different sources and you sort of want to combine them, um, you know, you have to look and examine, see um, how open one license is for one work and, and uh, see how it works with another license. So uh, this one gives you uh, an interesting view of, you know, make, uh, making and owning a particular copy. It seems to go through all the different licenses to things that are much more restrictive. And on the right hand of the page here, you have the OER and then not OER. So you get a sense of what you're working with. All right, so you've got, you've got some great content, but now you got to put it all together. So what sort of tools are you going to use? Um, so I just put these up here. These are just examples. Um, so if you're doing images, uh, you can use uh, GIMP. So it's open source. That's uh, an image editor available across various operating systems. So uh, quite common, quite useful. Um, you have the OER Commons Open Author that helps you build OER, lessons, plans, and courses that share openly on the OER Commons platform. So again, freely available. Uh, you have Pressbooks uh, as a simple book formatting software. A lot of folks use that one. It provides author support for publishing. That comes from Pressbooks. Of course, it is a subscription. So 
Uh, you do have to pay some money or your institution has to pay some money. Um, you also have book downs. So if you want to go with a particular software uh, programming language, for example, R, so you can use open source R package that facilitates writing books and long form articles reports with R markdown. So it depends on how much you know about uh, these particular uh, items, these examples of software tools. Um, there is an investment of time and effort that you have to put in in order to master these. So uh, if it's possible to bring in someone else to do um, use those tools, then that will save you a lot of time in creating your OER. So how's it going to be displayed? Is it going to be open format like HTML or EPUB, uh, PDF markdown, or is it going to be uh, a proprietary format like Word, uh, PowerPoint, Keynote, that sort of thing? You have to ask questions like that with regards to format. I just put a screen screenshot from one of the other books here talking about which format are you using, say PDF, you know, how editable is it? Um, what sort of recommendations you know that you can uh, that you should follow when using this, and then the software expertise that you need. So it's it's, it's all about making informed decisions. This is just a quick example on that. You want to consider um, issues of accessibility and usability. Um, so, you know, W3 school, uh, schools, you know, has this great code on web accessibility. So it means that people with disabilities can use the web and the web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web and that they can contribute to uh, the web. So web accessibility benefits others, including uh, older people with changing abilities due to aging. So there's a lot to consider there. Uh, so a um, couple websites that one would get started with, uh, with regards to accessibility and usability would be the Flexible Learning for Open Education there, It'll get you to uh, um, walk you through the process. And there's also the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. So you can put your, uh, your, your, your website or project up there and have, have, have them look at it and see uh, what changes that you need to make. So those are some of the ideas and questions that you need to consider. Um, like I said, the, you, we've just touched the top, uh, just the beginning of what is available out there. Uh, we'll send out a link uh, for these items a little bit later. So um, here are OER books on writing OER books. So that's a very quick overview. Um, I think at this point we can entertain questions. Okay, I see um, Ben has a question. Yes, thank you. So thank you both for that presentation. Um, this might be too broad. I think this might get into the territory where, um, where Kevin, you were saying, you know, go see a librarian. But what are the constraints for using non-OER material in something that becomes OER? Can I put an article from the New York Times in an OER textbook I give to my students? Can I do it if I add commentary? Can I do it if I edit out part of what's in there? And likewise for like a book chapter from an academic publisher. For, for that, you're, you're, you're moving into areas of, of copyright. Um, so if you're, if you're copying an incomplete article um, from that, then you need to get the, the permission of the New York Times in order to do that. And, and determine you know, whether they're willing to do that and are they going to charge you that sort of thing. So now if you're just doing a quote from that article, then obviously you don't need to, but it, it comes back to that as well. So uh, again, um, if it's also out of um, copyright, then you don't have to, if it's in the public domain, then you don't have to worry about that, but you have to be very careful in seeking permissions. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. So I, I was I was thinking that there might be a fair use exception if I add commentary or edit out parts of the article, but that might be really fact specific, and maybe I should you know just talk to someone at my institution about a specific article I'm editing or commenting on. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, someone with some copyright experience would definitely um, you know just just to run it by them because it better be safe and check than, than just assume that fair use applies mm. fair use is guidelines so you may think you know i'm doing fair use but you know new york times may say no you're not and you know worst case scenario you, know, you get sued in court and then a, a judge has to decide you know how many of the four tenants of fair use have been violated you know with any of them so <laughs> Got it. just to ask <laughs> appreciate it thank you yeah well. and ben i see that you're a gw and what we usually do in those cases when we are not sure about uh how you know fair use and copyright where that plays into what you're using we go directly to um uh, one of the staff members we have in the library that deals specifically with those issues so we would take whatever you're trying to use to him <laughs> and get his uh, expertise about it. So Thank sure. you. And, and so who should I go to as a, as a first contact if I have specific questions about that at GW? Uh, you can start with me. Um, okay. I'm, okay, I'm the, um, the committee member for GW. And then like that specific question, I would go to, um, his name is Barrett, and we would talk to him about it. All right. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I saw a question in the chat also. It says, uh, does WRLC or, or any WRLC member run an OER platform of their own? And uh, Kevin answered, um, we do not run our, a platform. Uh, we're hoping to fund one for individual textbooks. Uh, but um, I'd also just like to mention also uh, one of the resources that Kevin uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation, um, the Mason um, mom, I'm forgetting the uh, acronym. Uh, what is it? Oh, Kevin, are you familiar with the full? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. No, no, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I, I I can't remember the full name of the uh, acronym. I'm just stuck on mom right now. <laughs> That's fine. The Mason OER Finder. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, I'm just suggesting that that's a resource, um, a local resource that's, uh, you know, working to combine and find um, resources for uh, faculty interested in OER. Um, uh, I see another question from uh, Denise. Yes, <clears throat> I'm at the University of District of Columbia, and I'm trying to determine uh, what is the support of OER at the university and the development of OER. Um, we have just recently received in a school of business requests for our textbook selections for the spring and um, I, I've done OER before. I also teach at Prince George's Community College and they use OER as well as I teach at the University of Maryland Global Campus and OER is used there as well. But at UDC, we're asking for a textbook platform. And so that's why I was curious, what's the direction and how would I say that I wanted to look for something else um, or do I just present an OER textbook? I mean, is that, the, is that what I should do? Uh, I am not familiar with the policy and procedure at UDC. Um, there are a few members from UDC on the um, textbook affordability uh, committee. Um, I would suggest reaching out to them um, for specifically what UDC uh, has available. Um, I recommend Megan Kowalski at UDC. She's amazing. Yeah, I so hi, I'm from UDC as well, but I'm very, very new. <laughs> Literally, I've only been here for about two months, so I'm still learning the process myself. Um, but you can contact me and or Megan, and I can obviously put you in contact with Megan too. Um, her email address was at the beginning of the presentation, but I can share that with, with you separately. Um, I, I think you're speaking about the followed access program with the textbook requests, which is going through uh, the bookstore here. Still right. learning about that as well. Um, but yeah, that is a separate process from the, the OER um, options. But I think 
it will be mm -hmm. re well received. I just don't know what the, the process is yet. So we can definitely. Right, because um, the other thing that, that, that plays into at UDC, I don't know if you knew this, but students are as a part of their tuition given their textbooks. So um, it, it comes down in a file to them. And so I need to be able to, so now I have a McGraw-Hill textbook that they get a link to mm -hmm. as a part of their registration package along with all of their other textbooks, okay? Right. Um, and so they're asking for that so that they can make sure that they have that electronic textbook available to the students for the spring semester for my class. Um, but if you go some other route, clearly you have to figure out and I have to figure out how to direct that and let, you know, higher ups within the school of business know that, you know, I'm looking to do something different. And I didn't know, you know, what the process was. Yeah, I suspect it's, it's a department by department uh, mm -hmm. discussion for the OER part specifically. Um, I think you can choose to not, um, I don't know what the process is for file access, but I, I think you can choose to not use, um, you know, one of those official textbooks. But again, it's something that um, probably requires a step-by-step -step process. So I'll make sure that yeah. I reach out to you and connect you to Megan, who probably has a bit more Perfect. information. And Perfect. then we'll, we'll um, and I yeah, have to I'm, learn as well. So <laughs> I'm sure there's a step, I'm sure there's a process yeah. because, um, you know, a part of the process is to identify what your learning material is going to be. And so I'm sure there's a process that we have to do it. I just haven't seen anything. I was excited to see this opportunity because it's the first time I've actually noticed it, not to say mm -hmm. it hasn't happened before. I own that. It's the first time I've noticed OER as an opportunity for me to discuss at UDC. Um, and it's ironic, even today in my class, <clears throat> this is a perfect opportunity. The textbook is dated, okay? I teach business, one of the tech class I teach is business communication. And it was written prior to COVID. And so the description of meetings in this discussion, part of the discussion we had on group dynamics today is very different. It's mm -hmm. when we all go to the office nine to five and we sit in the office and we have an off meeting looking at each other. That's kind of the premise <laughs> of what's written in the textbook that they're using now. And I spent a lot of time sort of dissecting that. And so it's, it's yep. perfectly, you know, it's, it was written prior to COVID. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I will, I'll reach out, I'll send you an email and I'll connect, we'll talk with Megan. She's uh, way at a conference, but very responsive, amazing. And she's been teaching me a lot. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, I don't see any more in the chat. All right, so if there aren't any more questions, uh, we're going to end today's workshop uh, by saying thank you all for attending. Um, and if you have any more questions, again, um, reach out to the uh, committee member at your university and they'll help you more in detail. Um, and also expect to see the email from the Open Education Network today about uh, the opportunity to review a textbook and be eligible for the $200 stipend. Thank you, all right. And again, thank you all.